Well, for our this panel, please join me as I invite the moderator, Mr. Sagar Agarwal, co-founder and managing partner, Beams Fintech Fund. A huge round of applause for him, please. I hope all of you are done with your lunch. Yes, so I'm expecting a lot of energy. It's the last session as well. So inviting the speakers on stage, please join me as I welcome Mr. Alok Bansal, co-founder and vice chairman, PB Fintech. A very good evening to you, sir. We have Mr. Arpit, chief financial officer, Razor Pay. We have Mr. Gopal Srinivasan, Chairman and MD TVS Capital Funds. We have Mr. Raj Narayanam, Founder and Executive Chairman, Zagar Prepaid Ocean Service Limited. Last but not the least, our fifth speaker, Mr. Abhishek Bhagat, Managing Director, Digital and Technology Investment Banking, JM Financial Limited. So very good evening to each one of you and looking forward for the session. Thank you. Hi everyone. Uh, I know it's a lost session for the last three days and I'm sure you guys must be uh, tired of listening the same uh, Intel and knowledge about fintech. We'll try to keep it light. Uh, we have a very interesting uh, panel over here. Uh, we've got obviously a brief introduction was given by the speaker over here. But I think uh, not spending too much time on introduction, I want to delve deeper into uh, the specific conversation that we're doing about the report over here. Uh, so we've launched uh, underwritten a report along with JM uh, on the evolution of the fintech space from startup to IPOs. And we're trying to cover some of those points over here in terms of how important it is to go for public uh, listing and what is required to go for public listing and what has the sector been through in the last five years, uh, for 10 years, 15 years. We've tried to cover that and some of those snippets will be covered over here as well by the panelists. So thank you everyone for joining us. Much appreciate this. Um, I want to start my uh, first question uh, with Abhishek, right? And Abhishek, you've been the... Uh, uh, you've been the uh, uh, forefront of taking companies public right, for so many years. So given your rich experience in guiding some of the tech-driven companies public, I want to understand from your thought process and JM's thought process, what really ticks you guys to pick a company over the other? What are the key factors, key variables that you guys consider while choosing a company to, is that ready to go for a public or not? Thanks. Thanks, Sagar. Uh, hi everyone, it's, it's, it's great to be here, though, though again as a last session, but yeah, uh, we'll, we'll try and see how to make it more interesting. Uh, but, you know, Sagar, great question, but thing is, we also keep, need to keep in mind that once the companies are coming to us as a being public, it has traversed so much of grounds, right, and, and probably gone through multiple near-death experiences sometimes. So I think the time the company comes to us, obviously it's, it's very much mature in, its, in its, its journey to start with. But I think having said that, a few of the facts which then become more important is that a company when it's private may be going through multiple, multiple challenges on the growth maybe it could be going through multiple challenges on developing its organization. So I'm saying there are multiple things which are happening when the company is a private, but when it's about to go public, I think some of those things are hopefully sorted, and then that's what we kind of try and understand to a lot, large more, a lot more detail, right? So growth is obviously given, but how is the profitability shaping up, right? And that's increasingly becoming important in today's, you know, the market scenario. Uh, how, how is the company looking to do over the next, you know, 8 to 12 quarter, quarter on quarter? Is that number which is being, predict, being predicted, yeah. is, is, you know, company has enough control on that to meet those numbers or not, right? I think we look at also the, the overall governance framework and the corporate governance structure which company has, you know, at least wanting to put in place or already put in place because 
sometimes we do engage with companies very early on and we kind of help them in, in some of these processes, right? Yeah. So, so it depends on when we are actually trying to address some of these companies, but if it is, let's say, 12 months before the IPO, a lot of these things, we also help them put along with us. Uh, and and so, so that's more on the company side, but I think most of these, at least we see is, there is a dominant position in the market which they have already attained. So, so are there any likely competitive threats which could actually make the business unviable? Very tough, given the time it comes to us, but still, given that we are talking about a fintech industry, sometimes you know regulatory overhang could be slightly more than others, but, uh, but having said that, I think even if you look at banking, insurance, most of these companies are actually governed by regulators more than not. So, so to that extent, I think it's not so much of a, so much of an effort, but still, I think that is something which we need to keep in mind uh, as well. No, I think a uh, great thought process. I think Abhishek, right? A uh, bunch of factors involved while deciding upon, and companies obviously are at a critical, critical scale when you take them public. Um, I want to move to Alok, right? Alok, you guys have had a phenomenal run, right? In the last uh, couple of years, uh, it was one of the most touted IPO in the public markets, right? And uh, uh, 17, 18 times over subscription, 6,000 crore capital raise. I think uh, it would be interesting to know what were the, some of the most unexpected positives and challenges that you guys went through when you guys were thinking about listing, right? And uh, especially now you were adding one more regulator to the journey, right? You already had one, now there was one more regulator. So what, what was a positive uh, and challenge and unexpected during your journey? to the uh, amazing IPO and setting a benchmark for the entire market, right? I think uh, Policy Bazaar and Paytm were the two big IPOs that we looked up to all of us to see how the markets are accepting it. No, thanks, thanks for having me here. Uh, see, uh, the way we think at least as founders, uh, we cannot be too bothered about what's happening in the market. Yeah. You know, market has its own dynamic. There are a lot of external factors as well. Uh, we focus on what we can control, which is the execution of the company in terms of growth, in terms of profitability, in terms of efficiency, uh, customer service, all those factors, and uh, communicating the story to the investor community. Uh, one thing which is very different as a listed entity is that uh, you have to interact with a much larger investor community, but you don't have the depth of those discussions. So at a private company, you can spend weeks and weeks going into data, explaining your strategy, meeting, uh, getting them to meet your, with your team. In a listed scenario, you typically get one hour every quarter. And uh, you know, obviously, these analysts are also very, very busy. So you know, you have to maybe repeat the same communication multiple times. Also, some of the investors may be looking at every quarter. Now, in businesses like ours, things don't happen in quarter. Uh, but if you look back after three years, a lot of changed. Yep. So you have to sort of communicate that this is the sort of vision in medium term, long term for the company. If you are able to execute what you are communicating the trust starts to build over time. And when the trust starts to build, you get the you know, demand from the investors. Uh, I'm sure if the price is right, there will be supply also available uh, at the right time. But uh, it's just about uh, a very different dynamics in terms of how you look at interacting with your investor community. Yeah. Uh, one other thing which typically you know, we have realized is, honestly, some of the flexibility goes away. You know, as a private company, you can move very fast on a lot of things. A uh, lot of strategic stuff also, you just need to take to the board and just decide and move. Uh, as a listed entity, because there is a lot of concern around UPSI, and uh, also some of the things have to go through the shareholder approval, uh, the pace in some of these things will not be same as a private company, so you have to be ready for that. Uh, but it's a great outcome from investor perspective. They get a way to liquidate. Uh, as, as they want, when they want, and uh, same for the employees. I think uh, eventually uh, it also shows sort of coming of age indication to the market. So yeah, overall, I would say if company is ready, there is no harm in looking at yeah. going public. No, I think same, uh, uh, thank you, you know, uh, Alok. I want to take the same question to Raj, because Raj, you guys went public, uh, and uh, scale was a big decision factor, I would think, right? And 
I think the perception in India has always been that you need to be at a $100 million revenue business minimum, right, and profitable company to be able to go IPO. And you guys, uh, I think, chose the public market way much earlier, right? And I think the journey has been rewarding. Yeah. So it would be interesting to see uh, what did you guys think about what made you decide not to do the private route and go public market, right? I know you guys raised some capital, but still take that decision early on. So thanks, thanks, Sagar. So, you know, for us, the biggest question was private versus public. You know, and especially, you know, when you had like three, four term sheets with you, and it was an easy decision, you know, to go private. But, you know, one of the key reasons, and this was brought us, you know, brought to us by one of our uh, directors. He said, you know, and this is data which is dated, uh, you know, March of 2023, that, you know, in the last 15 years, okay, from there, only 440 companies have gone public. He said, how many companies do have the chance actually to go public, okay? Majority of the private, uh, uh, you know, funded companies typically, you know, the promoter typically moves out or, you know, has very little share. So for us, it was a call and, you know, that one single line by, uh, you know, a fellow director, Abhay, uh, made us decide, me and Avinash both decided that we have to go, uh, you know, public. It was a tough decision to say no to all the, you know, private uh, companies, especially, you know, when the valuations would have made you a unicorn plus plus and to go in for public and at that point of time the funding winter started the public market actually went down so so for us you know in hindsight it is a great decision you know we are very happy with the responsibility which has come on us as a public company and we also feel that you know the discovery to delivery process for us has been great no, thank you, Raj. Uh, in fact, we believe that the number that you mentioned, right, I think next five years to seven years, at least 75 tech companies which are financial services oriented yeah. will be going for an IPO, right? Absolutely. Maybe more. Yeah. We, we, we believe that at least 300 to $500 billion market cap could potentially be created out of this sector. Yep. If everything goes in that direction for, for all the potential investors at the same time. Absolutely. Uh, Gopal, sir, I want to take this question forward to you because I think Raj touched a very interesting point saying that staying private or going public, right? Uh, so you've been part of uh, very interesting companies in your journey, GoDigit, Five Star, big IPOs, right? Uh, and uh, you've been helping these companies, nudging them, helping them grow in the journey, think about IPO as a market. Uh, what specific markers do you think make these companies ready to go for public, right? And second, what's your view on staying private versus going public? Thank you, Sagar. I think, you know, my own sense is as private equity investors, we are focused on building a high quality business. Yeah. Institutional platforms ultimately, well governed, independent directors, for example, we don't appoint our own employees now as directors in any company. We always get an outstanding professional CEO who's built a great business to be a director. So I think it's all about building great businesses. IPO or not IPO, in my mind, we had to be clear what problem we're trying to solve. Are we solving a cap table problem because people want to exit? Are we creating an exit path for the founder and entrepreneur so this can become a professionally led company but multi diffuse shareholdership company? So is it most of people are approaching in my mind it's a cap table problem. But actually we should also see that the causality of that is a well governed, well built company. So when we look for markers, governance becomes a great marker. Obviously business quality otherwise you cannot take it to IPO. And the thing that I think in my mind is a go, no go for us is what is the quality of second level management, which means not necessarily even the mancom, but one level below. Our good examples have been ones where that levels have been very strong. Go digit five star in the recent portfolio would be great examples of that. Uh, Nika in our previous uh, investments. Our bad examples, the companies that went sideways as it were, where there was very charismatic founders, but over time the gap between the founders and the L1, L2, L2 management started increasing. So the founder was very powerful, very charismatic, but the L2s remained in some sense the old banyan tree does not allow anything to grow model, right? <laughs> so I think it's, so in short, business quality, team quality would be the two big factors and therefore IPO may be clear what problem we are trying to solve. It is not a, automatic single solution for everybody. 
No, no, absolutely. I think uh, it's some sort of a validation also, right? I think uh, private markets can stay private for a very long time and US obviously exhibits that, that you can stay private for a very long time. Somewhat, I think, uh, I'm just adding to your point, price discovery is also the right way to, one of the ways to think about it. Um, Arpit, to, your, uh, to you, I think uh, Gopal sir touched a very interesting point, right? Um, I'm sure there's a lot of discussion going on internally, right? To go or not to go, right? And uh, that leads to thinking about sustainability more, uh, probably financial metrics, what we should be building on, right? And uh, potentially strategic priorities of the company. So does that change anything for you guys from a thought process or it, it's, it's business as usual for you guys as you think about or are you not thinking about at the same time? No, uh, great question. Lots of questions in there. Let me try and uh, address, uh, you know, address a few of them. So I think to go or not to go, I think the answer to that is yes, we have to go. I think the question is timing, right? Um, and the way we've tried to approach this is <coughs> don't want, when we want to go as, as a decision rather than we should go public when we think as a business we are ready. Right now it's, you mentioned it, right? It's debatable. We are, we've always believed, you know, you need some level of scale, reliability, predictability to go public. But then, you know, we, we spoke about, you know, Zagel choosing to go a little bit earlier. So I think all, all, all options are possible. But the way we've, we've approached this is, we want to do what is organically right for the business. If you think about our, online payments business that has been around for eight or nine years, you know, we are focusing on profitability on that business. Right? You look at uh, bus businesses that have been around for three or four years, we are looking at revenue growth still and investing into that business. There is ample opportunity to get a good return on investment on those businesses. There are some very new businesses like marketing, uh, uh, you know, stack that we've, we've developed. Today we are focusing on, you know, we all joke about like the TPV equivalent, right? That what is the throughput in that business? So, so the way we are approaching this is that uh, we will continue to do the right thing by the right business at this stage. As a group, when we feel we are at a scale where we have, you know, where we have the right scale, right predictability, we think about, you know, we think about, uh, you know, going public. Uh, there are a couple of couple of things that are, I know you asked for strategic priorities. I think there are some, some base assumptions that we operate with, uh, that everything we do has to be linked to the movement of money and we are here to facilitate and make that easy for our customers. Uh, and, uh, you know, as long, and the fact that we are a B2B focused company, right? So what we, what, as, we as we look to diversify, try new things, we keep that base in mind. Uh, uh, but uh, broadly working towards doing what we think is right for the right business unit, and then when at an aggregate level we think it's the right time to go public, that's when we go public. Interesting. Uh, Sarah, I'll just add two points here. Uh, Alpit mentioned a very important point about predictability. Yeah. Eventually, you will get covered by some analyst, whether it's a bank analyst or whether it's an investor analyst. And uh, usually these are junior guys who will end up creating Excel models. If they can't understand your business very simply and they can't predict for next three, five years, it becomes tougher for them to take that call. And there are so many options for them to invest. If they're to invest in your company, they have to be able to create that model and that comes back to predictability. One thing which, uh, you know, markets have started to appreciate about digital companies is uh, the path towards profitability. And you know, why I want to focus on this specifically, there are only two types of business models in the world, either balance sheet focused or PNL focused. Now, balance sheet focused businesses are like this convention center or a hotel or a road or a lot of infra businesses or a lot of other factory businesses where the investment has to be done upfront. And then you make, uh, reap the benefit of that investment over time. In digital businesses, you have to invest in tech, you have to invest in marketing, you have to invest in you know, creating that brand. And unfortunately, because those can't be amortized, they come as cost on the penal from day one. And every year you have to see those losses. Uh, but technically, these are investments being made for future and if you're able to communicate your strategy clearly that why we are making that investment and how that will result into a better outcome on PNL in future years, uh, then you are sorted. But uh, I think now investors and markets have started to appreciate that part. 
Uh, no, I think you're right. Uh, predictability, sustainability, right? Communication is very, very important. Uh, and I think, Abhishek, you, you, might, you might be facing the pressure of it at the same time, right? Because you have to do the hard work of selling this to everybody in the market globally. But I want to ask you this uh, question more uh, specifically. Given the way IPOs, some of the IPOs in the our space, right, financial services and fintech space have not performed the way they were supposed to, at least during listing, right? And we did the study and it was surprising to see the listing, listing day gains were still in the range of 10 to 15% for, for some of the companies in the sector that we were, uh, that we were working on. So one, how do you um, communicate with the founders uh, the idea of pricing, right, and uh, keeping something on the table? for the investor, at the end of the guy who comes and wants to make money, right? Everybody's underwriting a 3x in every opportunity. So how do you manage the valuation expectation? Has it changed given that the market has rallied, right? And how do you balance it is what I want to, like, just pick your thoughts around it as well. Sure. I think firstly that maybe the time series is different also when you look at the analyzing companies and the, you know, the premiums at which it got listed, I think. So that has to keep, be kept in mind. If you see over the last one year, I think most of the companies, I would say, performed uh, well on the markets, right? So, so for sure, I think the understanding of valuation, et cetera, has been quite nuanced. Yeah. Maybe there was a learning phase way back uh, when, you know, um, the first wave of internet companies were getting listed, right? Uh, maybe the pricing was too optimized at that point of time. Uh, so, so I think that is the era which probably has now gone past, right? Uh, uh, we are today in an era where companies are being also evaluated very different, right? I mean, there was a time when everything was working on a revenue multiple, as we all know. Uh, today, it's a time where everything is largely working on a, you know, profit multiple of sorts, right? Yes, your profits could be two years away. Uh, on a steady state basis, maybe investors will give you benefit of that, but in the end, they're still, you know, tracking the profitability. Mm -hmm. So, so from that perspective, I would say that you know, <coughs> markets have changed a bit. Coming to you know valuation discussions and pricing discussions, uh, I think in the end, there are certain selling shareholders, right, which are tendering their offer for sale. Uh, there's some, sometimes money being, you know, raised into the company. But principally, I think most of the founders and investors have realized that it, it's just about maybe between 10 to 20 percent of dilution at best which is happening, right? And, and they're also now very well realized that these are the new set of investors who are coming to the cap table. Uh, and and, and they they have managed certain stakeholders, right, over the past, from seed to, you know, going public, and they want to deliver returns to those set of investors who are even coming in today. So I think to that degree, the pricing discussions have become fairly, I would say, simpler, uh, given that very nominal dilution happening, right, given that company are stepping on a new milestone from being public today, Right? So they want to create a story where, you know, investors also make money and they come back. So, so to that degree, I think we have seen a lot more mature conversations around valuation. Uh, and uh, I think also on the investor side, I think whether we call it a margin for safety, a margin for error, I think they're demanding a lot more. So, so to that degree, you know, you can't even price it at the top end of the spectrum. Yeah. Uh, so I think combination of all of these, but I think the markets from both investor side as well as founders and uh, I mean public investor side and the private investor side much more mature. Okay. Interesting. No, I think uh, as an investor that makes me happy that you know the markets are a lot more mature and we can get attractive prices. It still doesn't, I still can't find enough, but still uh, uh, hoping that we'll see a lot more opportunities. Uh, Gopal, so to, to you, uh, I think you touched upon a point uh, on before as well that what the, what's the cap table problem you're trying to solve, right? And what's the problem you're trying to solve for the company when you go for public? I think at the same breath, there's always a question about primary infusion versus offer for sale, right? That do you bring more fresh capital in the company or do you uh, give exits to the existing investors, right? Because that will determine the next five, seven years growth of the company as well. Uh, so how do you balance the expectation, right? Uh, and uh, I know as an investor, we have somewhat 
are limited, uh, say, I would say, to an extent what we want to do. But uh, there's always this challenge to decide whether you want to take more fresh capital in the company or do the offer for selling. So how do you work on those conversations at the board level? What strategic discussions potentially you can have with the companies as well? I think, Sagar, I think basically if you are, let us take two types of companies. There's a bootstrapped company like Raj, and there are basically companies that have used third-party capital to grow. Obviously, his problem is quite different or his uh, opportunity set is quite different than the opportunity set for those who have chosen. Yeah. One of the things that people should do when they get the second and third round before the IPO is to also grade the investors. The obsession with a term sheet valuation is no doubt an important one. No. But choosing the investors, for example, when we invested in, say, Five Star, or when we invested in GoDigit, we told them that we will not come for OFS. We will wait to see, because you're fundamentally a well-performing company, you'll continue to compound. So I, I don't understand at all why people would want to sell their OFS, unless there are fund life limits, which then makes kind of sense. I've invested, IPO took too long, mera fund agla saal khatam ho hai, to abhi abhi bhej denge isko. That is fine. But I think that is one thing. So I think people should look at saying, when will I go to IPO? They should, they should basically call Abhishek and say, what should be the fund life from whom I take money? They should plan this way ahead of time. Work back, don't work forward, is one thing I would say. I'd also like to, so I was listening to everybody, a thought entered my mind, I'd be free to share. Why public market at all is an important question. Because today, the total private capital AUM in the world is $10 trillion. Let us say the total public market is 100 trillion for the sake of typically the world GDP somewhere in that area. Maybe it's 120, maybe it's 110. The information arbitrage was high because in private markets you assume there is no information. Public markets you assume this information, this governance layer, LODR, hai. LODR is, gives a lot of comfort to all of us. But imagine today as the world has become more democratized in wealth with the addition of China and now India. Should we really think about permanently keeping companies <laughs> private, not necessarily private that is not traded? India is home to many number ones in the world, we know. And one of the number ones in the world potentially can be the world's largest listed unlisted company, which is also NSC. Yeah. Right? So NSC publishes information every quarter. They're highly regulated. They have to have predictability in their performance. So I don't think predictability, consistency, et cetera, are anything to do with listing or unlisting. If, a, if a today a growth equity company in the board meeting has to have consistent performance. So I think we also ponder a lot, is India ready for a regulated, unlisted securities, OTC type platform, where the companies on that platform will publish quarterly results quite regularly, will be of a minimum size and scale, say 1,000 crores of revenue or 100 crores of profit or so on and so forth. So can we also create that regulated, unlisted securities? Because information, if it's available, and the knowledgeable investors are available in India, we call accredited investors, for example. Why is it we need to get into listing and all the other aspects of investor? Listing basically brings in, more than anything else, the need for investor protection. The investor protection mindset means you have invited Chaukidar, NSG, CISF, everybody to come and stay in your house. So that, I think, is something we need to be understand. What is the true nature of public is that the Havaldar, Chaukidar, etc. will come into your house, CBI, ED, all this will come into your house. Do you really need it? Because if it's large investors, then we don't need it because they're knowledgeable. So I'm sorry if I went long, but I think we need to philosophically ponder in a country which has created the world's largest listed unlisted company. No, absolutely. I think the more private capital Obviously, the wealth creation in the country as it happens, right? So I think the, the, the opportunity to keep the companies private would be larger, right? At least uh, what we feel and the way uh, wealth is getting created in public markets today. A lot of people have enough and more wealth in the private market to keep the companies private. We also need perpetual capital in private equity and venture capital, right? Here we have a term life capital, which makes our life a little bit more complicated for all of us with the 10 plus 2, 8 plus 2, 12 plus 2. So we are always under pressure to not uh, create an exit, right? And we have to... But Sagar, just think about one more thing. Sure. Listening to one more thing popped into my head is we are now at the beginning of, in the private markets, of secondary funds. Yes. And that is going to become a phenomenon. So with a good secondary fund, 
perpetual means I should live forever. Yeah. But being an Indian, I say I may not live forever, but there will be rebirth. rebirth. So I just keep on handing from baton to baton, from generation to generation. So I think secondaries is also one more factor. So I think optionality will come and it will not become I have to do A. I will think and carefully do what is right. No, I think uh, uh, secondary is a very uh, interesting thought process, right? And um, I think it's a willing buyer and a willing seller, right? Which is where we are a little bit, uh, as Indians, a little bit more conjuice, I would say, for lack of a better word. The buyer always wants the best price and uh, seller also wants the best price, right? So kind of gets tricky, but I'm hoping the secondary market will evolve a lot more deeper and we'll get a lot more opportunity. Uh, Alok, just to you, right? I think uh, you mentioned about predictability and sustainability as well. Uh, and consistency of communication. Do you guys feel, and on a lighter note, do you guys feel the pressure of quarterly calls, earnings, reports, uh, showing face every quarter and talking about the same thing? And you know, it's it's sometimes the businesses do not have enough more to show in the quarter because you're building long-term stories. So, do you feel the pressure of it? Uh, not really the pressure. I mean, yes, you have to interact every quarter. I mean, we end up talking to 150 to 250 investors every quarter. Uh, and some of them are new, a lot of them are repeat conversations. Uh, but till the time you are communicating a particular strategy which is medium to long term and executing on that path and able to deliver those numbers that you are talking about, it should be okay. I mean, uh, most of the investors, uh, yes, there will be few who will be focusing on quarter because there are some hedge fund sort of investors, but there are very few of them usually. Most of them are happy to stay with the company if the company is doing well. Yeah. Uh, you know, from founder's perspective, when Abhishek was also mentioning about uh, the valuation, at some point you actually grow up in your mindset and you start to think of which investor you want, as a private company also, as a public company also. Uh, so rather than the valuation, because see, in a public company anyways, at some point market will give you the value, what market believes is your value. Yeah. Whatever you want to think about, you can't really do much. <coughs> but what investors you want is something you can still work on. Uh, both as private and public. So, like in our journey, for last three or four rounds, since 2014 onwards, we listed in November 21. So, from 14 to November 21, all of our rounds were very directed towards a particular investor that we want that invest on the cap table, whatever the valuation doesn't matter. Similarly, at the time of listing and even post listing, we have worked specifically on few investors very, 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 you know, dedicatedly that we want these investors on the cap table because they will add value, they are long term and uh, you know, company will go through up and down, that happens to each and every company. But if you have a stable cap table, that helps a lot. No, no, I think uh, the interesting perspective that you and Gopal sir also bring that public companies also have to think about the kind of investors you bring, right? I think it, it was always more function of markets, but I think good for the founders over here to understand that it's a public and private brings the same requirement that you need to keep building for long-term investors. Uh, before we conclude the IPO conversation and go back a little bit behind the journey, right? And I'll come to uh, you, Arpit. But I just want to take a last quick uh, comment on the IPO journey from Raj, right? Uh, how are you feeling the new challenges post-listing, right? And uh, I see a barrage of announcements, right? Uh, and good positive announcements, so you know, congratulations to you guys. But Thank you. do you see any anything different uh, pre and post? And seems like the consistency has to be the more important factor, whether you're a public or a private company. But are you guys um, experiencing something different, challenges, opportunities? No, of course, uh, you know, so the key thing is that we have to be much more disciplined. You know, when I was bootstrapped, there was no pressure, you know, from anywhere, okay? I didn't have to answer to anybody and that is one of the reasons that we chose, uh, you know, to remain, uh, you know, private. See, ideal situation is if you get private equity kind of behavior in public funds, that is what is your ideal choice. So long term, long term, long sustainable, you know, capital, patient capital with you, you know, with the ability, you know, to change hands either through, you know, fund transfer or, you know, block deals. So that is your ideal uh, uh, situation. And for us also, you know, our, our entire story is, you know, from discovery to delivery because, yeah. you know, we are a 150 million revenue company now. So not too many people actually, you know, it's a small size for a lot of large, uh, you know, funds. And they want to see that, you, you know, would you be able to take it to 300, 500 million, which of course you will say, you know, you will tell them, yes, and, and you know it's it's the bet which they take but you know the beauty is 
uh, unlike private, where the conversation, if it ends, it ends, okay? Yeah. There is, you know, full stop period. For public ones, you can continuously engage with them, and at some point of time, they will come. Okay, so what it tells you is that more consistency, more uh, discipline, more predictability, more sustenance you are able to show to them, you know, more will come to you, you know, in some form or the other. And that, was, that is what has been our experience. You know, we are up 130, 140% 140 from where we were. And, you know, when we were doing our roadshow, Zomato was at 48 rupees. Okay, so just think, you know, which market, you know, we were trying to raise funds. But we have been very patient and, you know, uh, things have turned out to be very, very good. I think uh, the takeaway is patience, right? Everybody, as long as you're patient and doing the right things, things will fall in place for you. Arpit, then, given, taking that last thought, right, and then, then quick last conversation with everybody. Um, sector has evolved, right? It's come of age, right? And uh, obviously, you guys uh, have had your own journey in the same time. Um, and we briefly spoke about this also, that what, what do you think the sector has come off in the last couple of years, regulatory-wise, in general? Uh, what do you uh, give as a feedback to uh, uh, aspiring founders in terms of how they should be thinking about their businesses as well? So it's a great question. Uh, see, I, I think um, particularly if I talk about, uh, you know, the space we are in in largely payments, uh, you know, the, the online payments business got to a scale where I think there was a clear need for regulation. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, all, all fintech businesses go through that journey, have gone through that journey, or will go through that journey. When something's, you know, when something is small and innovative, uh, you know, the regulator probably is not focused on that, but as some things scale up, uh, you know, the regulator will eventually come. And therefore, I think it's important to think about, you know, doing the right thing right up front. Because you create a model which you know is, uh, you know, one is, one is trying to innovate, second is trying to have a regulatory arbitrage, right? So I think the focus should be on innovation. And if you develop the business that, you know, that way, you don't want a situation when the regulation comes that it completely, you know, it surprises you, right? So, uh, having said that, uh, you know, everybody, you know, we've all been surprised even though we've, you know, we've tried to do that, but I think there are some basics of what does the regulator want, right? Regulator wants the, the, you know, the average last person to be not impacted, right? Trying to take care of the end customer. So, I think keeping that in mind as you look to develop businesses, uh, you know, uh, especially in the fintech space is very important because whether you have the regulation today or not, you should hope that you are in a segment which is going to grow massively, and that means that you know the regulation will come. Uh, and I think we've the other advantage uh, once the regulation comes is then you have an ability to more directly engage with the regulator, and I think things actually become smoother after that. It becomes a level playing field for everybody as that, well. Right? That it's, 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 it's a very progressive uh, I think thought process that RBI has. Right? I think we all have been watching it closely. Um, I think different people watch, look at it differently, but I think it's a positive sign making it a more level playing field for everybody. So, no, I think thank you so much you know, uh, uh, to all the panelists. Uh, I wish all Alok all the best, you know, the way it's performing. Uh, Raj, the way it's performing for you. Abhishek, all the IPOs that you guys are bringing to the market. And uh, to you guys for your IPO and sir, looking forward to working together as well. Uh, we will take this opportunity to uh, at least present our report, right? Uh, I know it's a closing session, but want to just quickly uh, introduce the report that we've done. We've tried to cover a lot of points over here from the report in terms of what you need to do from an IPO perspective, how do you need to think about listing, how do you need to think about opportunity. Um, so uh, allowing us just another five minutes, guys, to quickly launch the report as well. Uh, Abhishek, you want to come as well? Yeah, I think we'll take this one. Um, so thank you everyone again for uh, being patient over here and listening to us. I think it's with great pleasure and excitement that we stand over here before you at the Global FinTech Fest and uh, an event that brings together innovation, dynamism, and relentless pursuit of excellence uh, within the FinTech industry. As we, as we gather here amongst the leaders, innovators, and key shareholders from across the globe, it's a testament to the incredible growth and transformative power of the FinTech industry, particularly in India. Um, over the years, we've witnessed Indian fintech space evolve from a nascent sector 
to a robust ecosystem that is now setting global benchmarks. Um, our report over here delves into extraordinary journey, capturing India's growth story, uh, key trends and opportunities. I think the key takeaway for everyone would be that over the next seven years, right, uh, we expect 75 to 80 companies to go public. Uh, we expect uh, India to have 150 unicorns, uh, creating a market value of half a trillion dollars. Um, I'm sure you'll find a lot more takeaways on some of the historical past of the, uh, the fintech sector, some of the challenges, some of the key trends in the emerging segments that you're seeing. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone, including JM team, our team that have worked hard so towards this report, and hope you guys enjoy reading it. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to JM uh, Abhishek to share his thoughts as well. Quickly, I'll try to summarize. But I think net net, we have tried to cover uh, our learnings over the last two to three years when we have been taking uh, various companies to the IPO journey, right? And a lot of it has been packed uh, into this report. Uh, I, I hope you'll find it useful as you plan for your respective journey to be an IPO soon or over the next three years or five years. Uh, so I think with that, I will not uh, uh, hold everyone much. We'll probably invite uh, our guests to kind of release the report to, to, uh, to this audience. Yeah. I think we can have the JM team and Beam's team also you know, come if possible. <laughs>